I'm going to show you how I design. Excellent. Okay? Most people use CAD, mm -hmm. computers, all sorts of high tech. Yeah. Whatever happened to pencil and paper? Oh, there you go. This is my analog, analog CAD. Analog CAD file. <laughs> and this is how. Wow, look at that. This is how I design my knives and make them, make drawings, and then I make little cardboard cutouts, sometimes plastic cutouts. And that's basically how I do my design. Hi, I'm Richard with Bear Claw Knife and Sure, and I happen to be here with the famous, or some say infamous, Bob Terzola. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> you know, I'm honored to be here. We're in your shop. Well, you're welcome uh, to be here in the shop. We had a wonderful breakfast this morning. I know, I never stuff. thought he'd stop eating. <laughs> we're here in the San Diego area. We're very like minded, surprisingly. We are. You know, we're, we're very like minded. And we both so, love uh, pie. And we both love pie. Pie is very, very important. True. I had a coconut cream pie this morning. That was mm -hmm. exceptional. It says that you were inducted into the Cutlery Hall of Fame. Uh, Hall of Fame at the Blade Show in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You're named of, as one of the four living Mount Rushmore, in parentheses, legends of modern knife making. They actually had a drawing of me and uh, I think Michael Walker and uh, I can't remember who the other two were, as if we were on Mount Rushmore. You are a big name in the knife making, knife designing industry. I mean, we see you everywhere, collaborations and so forth. I understand you were Born in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Went to school in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New York, to uh, Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan. Full scholarship to New York University. NYU for industrial arts education. So I, was, I was going to be a shop teacher, and then I realized I really didn't want to do anything for 20 years over and over and over and over again. So I joined the Peace Corps, went to Panama. They asked me to become a, uh, to be a, a trainer, Peace Corps trainer. Mm -hmm. So they recruited me in Panama, I went to Puerto Rico, fell in love with one of my trainees who was going to Guatemala, mm -hmm. followed her down to Guatemala. She married somebody else, but that's another story. Stayed in Guatemala for many years. I've managed uh, J Jewelry Factory. I worked on several government programs, uh, mainly in agriculture and education, mm -hmm. uh, doing field studies. I was kind of a specialist in um, recruiting interviewers, Mm -hmm. going out into the field, creating questionnaires, finding out what people needed to know and how to, how to glean that information through an interview. Worked uh, later on with uh, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance in uh, both El Salvador and Guatemala mm -hmm. doing, I did the, um, the war damage surveys mm. after the, after the war, Civil War in El Salvador mm -hmm. and the uprisings and troubles they had in Guatemala. And while I was in Guatemala working in the uh, Jade Factory mm -hmm. as a manager, uh, my neighbor, uh, Colonel Atwood, Jim Atwood, uh, he got me interested in making knives. He had some old, what were at that time, the American Blade magazine. Mm. It was put out by Beinfeld. Um, it's the, the forerunner of the modern blade magazine, but this was the American blade. About yep, what year was this? This would have been uh, 1980, 1979, 80. Mm -hmm. So you were still in the, the jade carving Jade business. carving, yeah. I was, I was teaching uh, the, uh, the people at the jade factory how to carve, how to polish, mm -hmm. and um, managing. I was the general manager of the factory. I had about 36 people working for me. And Atwood was my next door neighbor. I mean, I could tell you stories about him that, first of all, would take most of the afternoon. Yeah. Second of all, you wouldn't believe him. Yeah, really. Okay. But basically, he made his living out of buying up defunct factories mm. or stuff that nobody wanted. He'd go to customs auctions and buy things that nobody even knew what they were. And he'd find out why these things were imported and find out to the people uh, who wanted them and he'd resell them and so forth. Sure. But when he lived in Germany, he went around uh, in Zollingen, which is the German um, knife making center, mm -hmm. Zollingen, Germany. He went around to all of the knife makers and uh, the f different fact factories and he bought up all of the pieces and parts of the 
daggers and knives from World War II that they had made. <coughs> Pardon me, gotta have a cough drop here. <coughs> Allergies. But no. um, after the war, they were, uh, Germany was forbidden to produce weapons. Mm -hmm. But the Germans, of course, never throw anything away. Yeah. So they had uh, all these pieces and parts, basically uh, the blades, the handles, the hilts, the scabbard parts, and so forth. <coughs> they had them all in storage. <coughs> yep. You gonna be okay? Do yeah. you want some water? Yeah, a little water would be good. Okay, let me go get Take some a quick water. break for some water. <laughs> Bought them all up, went back to Savannah, Georgia, had them reassembled. They were genuine parts, they sure. just had, weren't together. And he sold them, usually in the back of uh, different magazines like Argosy or True Detective, those little one-inch square advertisements, you know, German yeah. uh, Luftwaffe dagger or youth dagger, those were all his. He wrote about Paul Mueller, who nobody's ever heard of. Mm. Paul Mueller was the German who rediscovered Damascus steel. He actually made some and there are pictures in the book of leaf-shaped kind of letter openers yeah. that he gave to Hitler and Himmler and, you know, all those guys and so forth, because mm -hmm. it was the 30s, would wrote about it. So anyway, he was really into knives, knew a great deal about knives, mm -hmm. and he got me interested. And he said, you know, a lot of this machinery that you're using here with the, with the jade mm -hmm. is very similar to, you know, what they use to make knives. He said, yeah. why don't you get into that because I had always made knives as a kid you know and yeah. made some in college and things so um, that's how I started basically in 1980 Christmas 1980 I finished my first knife for sale I said to myself two things one mm. people have more pockets than they have belts you can't carry too many fixed blades but you can carry a bunch of folders second of all when I go to a knife show I've got a suitcase. Mm -hmm. I could carry maybe eight or 10 fixed blades. Mm -hmm. In those days, you could carry them on the airplane. Yeah, yeah. You know, which is what I did. Yeah, things were a lot different back but then. But I could carry 10, you know, maybe yeah. eight or 10. Mm -hmm. But folders, I've gone to shows with as many as 35 folders. It makes a big difference. So I just did, decided, you know, uh, let, me, let me talk to the guy who I really respected most and who was living fairly close to me in Taos, mm -hmm. Taos, New Mexico, about two hours away from Santa Fe. Yeah was Michael Walker. Mm -hmm. And he was doing two things that I admired. One, he was doing the liner lock, mm. which I considered to be the strongest and best lock on a folding knife, yeah. any kind of a folding knife, yeah. for a number of reasons. We don't have to go into it now, but for a number of reasons. Secondly, he was using titanium. Mm. Now, at that time, nobody was using titanium. Mm. It was all thing that we're talking about the early 80s. Sure, everyone okay. uses it now, but... Back Everyone then, uses it now, but not nobody. Then. He yeah. was the only one. And I actually got my first pieces of titanium. I went to uh, a knife show in Eugene, Oregon, mm -hmm. and I had all fixed blades, but I was just getting into the folders. I hadn't refined it. I hadn't made any yet. This was just fixed blades. Mm -hmm. And from Eugene, Oregon, I went to Kent, Washington, to the Boeing factory. Yeah. And I went in their backyard. And they had this big box full of titanium. Beautiful. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, yeah. I picked up this piece. I picked up that piece. You know, We wrapped them up. I paid, I don't know what I paid, <laughs> a couple of bucks or something. It wasn't very much. Yeah. Know? And carried them back on the airplane. Big sheets of wow. titanium like this. You know? <laughs> and um, started designing my folder. The Model 1 mm -hmm. was my first folder. It was a utility knife. I call it the utility, mm. just a basic utility. And I didn't see any real need for scales or handle materials or, uh, you know, wood or mastodon or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they were just plain titanium. Yeah. And there were three pieces. <coughs> mm -hmm. Center spring, which was the, the liner, yeah. liner long, yeah. and two sides. Mm -hmm. And some people would say, well, but, yeah, but they're not symmetrical. I said, so what? Yeah. What does it matter? Yeah. You know, I, need, I, don't, I had to carry the titanium back on the airplane. I wasn't going to put an extra piece in there just to no. make it symmetrical. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, that was the Model 1 mm -hmm. the utility. The second one was the Mariner, mm. Model Number 2. And that had a sheep's foot blade. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, kind of a, a relatively simple handle, but once again, uh, all titanium. Mm -hmm. Good blade for a mariner. Yep, perfect. Yep, it was, you know, stainless steel, titanium, totally rust proof, mm -hmm. you know, the whole deal. And then came the ATCF, mm -hmm. which at that time was called the model number three. Yeah. It was, just, it was just the model three. But it was what we call now the ATCF, the Advanced Technology Combat Folder. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of the tactical knife experience for me. This is my biggest and one of the most uh, accurate machines. This is the milling machine. And I've got a whole bunch of fixtures that I've made to fit on here. Fixtures that I make to, to hold uh, blades or handles or whatever I'm working on mm -hmm. um, in a certain position to do a certain operation, especially if I'm doing several of the same knife. I can just use a fixture. Mm -hmm mount the piece in the fixture, perform the operation, take it out, put another piece in the same fixture, mm -hmm. and not have to reset the machine up every time I'm... Uh, makes things a lot faster. Things. Yeah, makes yeah. things a lot faster. So moving along here, we're down on grinder row. I have three Burr Kings. I've had these uh, three Burr Kings close on 40 years, 35, yeah. 40 years. I got them at different times. Now for those folks that don't know, these, these Burr Kings, they're like the Cadillac. Of, I of, call them the Cadillac of, of grinders. Yeah, they really are nice. Yeah. We, we, we sharpen on Birking. Well, the, there's, yeah. a, there's one specific reason why I like Birkings. I can show you on this one over here. And that is that unlike most other grinders, or I think any other grinders, Birking has a front drive. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Which means that I can take this contact wheel off yeah. And I can put a scotch Bright wheel. Yeah. I can put a, a, a grinding wheel. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a video that we did on Instagram of me uh, uh, carving some jade, mm -hmm. shaping a jade scale. And I used a uh, large eight inch diameter diamond wheel and just put it right on here. Excellent. Uh, most of the other grinders, the, the belt grinders, yeah. they have a drive wheel in the back. Yeah. And the front wheel is just an idler wheel mm -hmm. run by a belt, so you can't do that. Yeah. You can't put anything on there. Here's how I do my water cooling. It's an IV bag. IV bag. What I do is I just clip a uh, kitchen sponge right on here. Yeah. And IV drip right into the sponge. Really? Yep. It just keeps your belt wet enough to where you can use the diamond. And you can see that over here. I have the same thing on my uh, cutoff wheel. This is a diamond cutoff wheel. Yeah. And I have the same thing here. I just put a, I don't know if you can see that dripping. And I turn it on and get sprayed. Okay. That keeps whatever I'm cutting with the cutoff wheel, keeps it nice and cool. Yeah. So you got to keep the diamond cool. Yep. If you don't keep the diamond cool, you just wear it out. I used to tell my uh, jade carvers in Guatemala, because we used a lot of diamond tools carving jade. Yeah. Diamond likes high speed, Mm -hmm. Lots of water and low pressure. These are my, actually buffers, but I don't use them as, as buffers. I don't do very much buffing, buffing, polishing, yeah. buffing. These are diamond cutoff wheels. I use these for cutoff, whatever has to be cut. Mm -hmm. This one I use for putting the notches in the back of um, on the uh, thumb ramps. This is the main workbench. This is where I do basically all the assembly, planning, laying out. Screwing together, unscrewing, getting the knives ready for uh, production. These are, these are ready, getting ready for the uh, Friday Night Blade Affair. This is one pretty close to getting finished. This is an ATCF. And I like to have all my tools that I use on a daily basis right within reach, standing in front of the workbench. Pretty lazy. I like to have things within reach. My well, hammer's makes you so here. much more efficient yeah. if you do that. I've yeah. got a whole bunch of measuring tools. Mm -hmm. My hammers, pin vices, all sorts of special vices, and uh, one of the one of my uh, ten rules of Terzawala's laws of the shop. 
mm -hmm. is you can never have too many uh, clamps or vices or holding devices. Yeah. Holding the work is 50% of the job. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> well, drill press row. And I have a whole bunch of drill presses. These are two turret drill press presses, uh, Bergmasters. Marvelous de uh, devices. This is what factories used before CNC automatic robots. Mm. This is what they used. They had banks and banks and banks of these machines. And basically, you drill, drill a hole or whatever you want to do, mm -hmm. flip it back, and go to the next one. The sequence would be preset in the machine. Sure. Um, small drill, proper size drill, mm -hmm. maybe a reamer, countersink or something like that, which I've got right around here. And I've got two of these machines. These were made up until probably about the late 50s, I think. Where'd you find these? Uh, eBay. Really? Both of them on eBay. No yeah. And they're still, you can still find them on eBay, as a matter of fact. Yeah? Yeah. My big drill press is the, uh, that's the one I use for just about, you know, all different size drills and so forth. Yeah. But this drill press is uh, dedicated uh, countersink. That's all I do that's here. All that's all it does. That's all it does. And this drill press is also dedicated with a tapping head. Yeah. Got a Tapmatic 30X tapping head. And that never comes off there. And over here we have the carving bench, which I call the carving bench when I'm doing jade carving. This Still a, do some jade? This was a jade suba that I made for a sword. I really enjoy carving jade. Here's a white jade horse. So this is the carving bench. I've got uh, diamond, diamond tools here. Mm-hmm polishing bits, all sorts of diamond equipment in here. All small stuff, uh, dental size, basically, Yeah. for uh, hand carving. This is my wall of honor up here. Patches that I've gotten from people who use my knives all around the world. And these are plaques of three patents I have. One for a bayonet sheath. Another one, this is the design patent from Spyderco for the, uh, the, the Starmate from my original, which was the uh, Century Starfighter. And then this is for the T-clip. Was that you? That was me, I invented that. Oh my goodness gracious, we use that all the time. You didn't know that? I did not I know that. that. Tech the lock. original tech yeah. lock. Yeah, that was the original tech Amazing. lock. Amazing. That was brilliant. There's the patent. There's my name. Wow. That's crazy. I had no idea. Yep. That is a brilliant invention. That tech lock is amazing. And over here we have the lathe bench. These are, I have the three very accurate machines, two American. Mm -hmm. These are Derbyshire. These are jewelers' lathes. Very, very accurate. And the third one over here is a Shoblin. Also extremely accurate. And this is a, an accurate but more common Chinese model. It's, it's, a, it's just a bigger machine. I can do slightly bigger operations on there for things I don't need that kind of exact precision on, mainly for tooling and making tooling fixtures. And behind you, if you do 180 degree, Susie's VW bug. There it is. Yep. <laughs> and I've got my uh, Rockwell bandsaw. Yeah. Variable speed metal or wood and right next to it that big big uh, blue box there that's my furnace for heat treating that's a paragon i know paragon and even heat seem to be the two biggies mm -hmm. it comes from knife makers everyone's kind of split right down the middle yeah use the i've other. used that for many years and this is the soldering bench over here i call it soldering uh we do any kind of heating or uh, melting, if I'm melting gold or silver, yeah, I do it right here, all protected mm -hmm. with uh, tile and fire, fire brick and so forth. And this is my sink and chemical bench, uh, ferric chloride, hydrochloric acid, uh, TSP mm -hmm. for anodizing, um, stainless uh, coloring, blackening. And over here, the sandblaster, and we're pretty much back again in uh, the corner of the shop where the milling machine is. Thank you for showing us your shop. It's my pleasure. I'm it's glad you could make shop. it. Well, I'm, I really am so worth the trip out here to finally meet you. 
And uh, up to now, you've been a name I see constantly uh -oh. in one place uh -oh. or another. It's true for uh -oh. many, many years, and uh, it's really been a pleasure. Yeah, being John here Dillinger had a name that everybody used to see constantly <laughs> too. No, but yours is yours is in a good way. A uh, good way, good okay. Way, yeah. Uh, you're really a legend in this business. Oh, and, thank uh, you for saying that. But, but you know. it's it's true. You are. You were there in the beginning of when so much of this was being innovated, and uh, the history you have up there. I, you know, it's just amazing. Um, so much of what we see every day right now, and in, and in, in modern folders comes from the work that you did and the innovation that you did. So well, thank you for saying that. Well, thank you Appreciate for sharing it. it with us today. Of course, this is another great video coming to you. And the reason we're able to come out here and do this is because you go to bcknife.com, shameless plug, and you buy knives from us and other things, cookware or whatever else it might be. Because you get things at our store, we're able to come out here and document, uh, you know, not only currently what's happening in knives, but also the history of where it all comes from. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Make sure you give us a thumbs up. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and uh, join us in future videos. And uh, in the comments below, tell us what you think. And uh, till next time. Thank you, Richard. Bob, thank you. We'll see you. Pleasure. Then. Bye. Bye.